Welcome to Root Words, a podcast that explores agriculture and cooking's role in connecting us to our landscape and our communities. I'm Stephen Abatel. Root Words is a collaboration between Vermont Farmers Food Center, Shrewsbury Agricultural Education and Arts Foundation, and many other community members. We're excited to introduce you to some passionate folks that are bringing communities together around food. So please pull up a chair and enjoy. Welcome back to our fourth episode in a five-part mini-series exploring how a focus on local food builds relationships with people and the environment. If you haven't followed the mini-series, you may want to go back and listen from episode 26, Localizing the Regional Food System. In our last episode, we explored some relationships that people have with their foodways and some of the impacts that are felt when these relationships are damaged. And we heard how some folks are restoring their community's relationships with the land and with each other. If the community food web relationships are strong and vibrant, it may become possible to create a physical space that can be an active center to the web, providing enough general use attributes for the entire web to thrive. In this episode, we'll explore Vermont Farmers Food Center's plans to rejuvenate the historic buildings at 251 West Street in downtown Rutland, Vermont, and build an urban food center on the site of the former Lincoln Iron Works. Buildings aren't usually what comes to mind when we envision a vibrant local food system. We may picture a densely cultivated field, or perhaps a farmer chatting up customers at market. But like many background players, buildings, physical spaces to work, gather, warehouse, and create, play a vital role in our food system. In a globalized food system, buildings like this are often far away and out of sight, increasing energy demands for transportation while decreasing accountability to the community of consumers. Likewise, our towns and cities often have out-of-sight spaces that fall into decay after their initial era of usefulness has waned sometimes even becoming dangerous liabilities for the community if left inactive for too long. 251 West Street in Rutland, Vermont is just this sort of site. The 2.9-acre industrial site hosted many forms of manufacturing over the past 170 years. Notably, the Lincoln Iron Works centered a thriving community that anchored families and adjacent businesses to Rutland. But like many manufacturing centers of the U.S., The gears eventually ground to a halt when the globalizing economy shifted this work elsewhere. Local historian Jack Crowler has researched this site's rise to prominence and subsequent fall into disuse. Uh, Lincoln foundries turned out a lot of things, plowshares, railroad carriage castings, uh, the Crescent Coffee Mill, um, the iron frames that used to support pupils' desks and seats in schools across the country. Um, so the the Ward Well channeling machine, the Frenier sand pump that um, both originated in Rutland and and then were taken over by Lincoln Iron Works you know, wholesale distribution of plumbing and heating supplies, but not manufactured there. Um, By 1953, Lincoln was mainly a subcontractor, but they were um, switching their outfit to meet whatever someone needed. You know, going going back to the earlier days, um, the... uh, Rutland Directory of 1874-75 listed uh, the company's abilities. Proposals made for machinery, machinery of every description, steam engines made and repaired, light and heavy castings, derricks, hoisting machines, gearing, pulleys, and shafting of all lengths and sizes. You know, they cast aluminum furniture during uh, later years and uh, you know they they produced castings for the springfield the machine tool industry jones and lampson and bryant chuck and grinder 
you know, I was the uh, editor for the Southern Vermont desk at the Herald and, and the sort of the decline of the machine tool industry, which was um, really a, a, a big deal in Vermont and really important to, um, you know, not the, the war effort and um, just, you know, American industry in general, they the, those uh, companies got bought up by conglomerate conglomerates and the uh, the local um, you know version or, or the local parts of uh, the local companies kind of went went into went into decline. Yeah, I mean it it had its its heyday heydays plural, and uh, I guess World War Two um you know was was one of them but it by that time they i think the writing was on the wall for um for uh you know the the dying out of the old old time manufacturing even even though the war was sustaining it for a period of time you know squatters started using it and um, you know, there were some notable fires. There are a couple of a couple of big ones that destroyed, um, you know, buildings that went back quite a ways. And, and I think that was a, a, a sad loss because I think, um, you know, some of those structures were probably went back to the 1800s and, and uh, uh, were, were had some architectural significance. Adaptation and reuse of aging infrastructure provides a path forward that revitalizes neglected, once thriving areas and protects open spaces from unnecessary sprawl. Lisa Papazian has been working for 30 years in historic preservation and is now based in Putney, Vermont. Vermont Farmers Food Center brought her in to assess the eligibility of the buildings at the 251 West Street site for listing on the National Historic Register. Lisa says that historic preservation and adaptive reuse are starkly different. Preservation is important in some instances, but its use is narrowly appropriate. It seeks to freeze a historic building in at a moment in time, what determined to be the, its most important, and removes everything that changed after that and may even restore features that were known to have existed at that time, hopefully based on evidence. Um, and it's you know, very appropriate for a museum setting, a historic house museum type setting, or um, other interpretive educational uses. But in the real world, it's rarely appropriate because buildings um, are not pieces of sculpture. They are living, breathing entities that serve uh, our lives and our lives continue to evolve. So adaptive reuse is the process by which our historic buildings can continue to serve and continue to be relevant and um, vital. And that means even, even a building that's continued to be used for its original purpose, like a school, um, the, what, what re requirements of a school when the building might have been built in 1900 evolved over time and are very different now. Code Codes are very different now, building codes. And so in order to continue using the building, we have to adapt it. I, I just, you know, I wouldn't be in this line of work if I didn't, um, if there wasn't adaptive reuse, because I don't believe in historic buildings as just architecture. I, you know, the thing that is um, compelling to me about his architecture is it's, human component and how people created it, why they created it, what materials they used, and how the, how life unfolded in those buildings. Um, mm -hmm. That's what's important to me. And if they don't have life in them, they're not no longer that interesting and certainly won't survive if they um, don't have a use. So mm -hmm. Vermont in particular has a um, wonderful uh, historic housing ha building stock. Um, it's a it's a it's a state that you know for better or worse went through peer long periods of um, economic 
decline or um, th that actually preserved a lot of historic buildings because they weren't re weren't replaced, weren't um, substantially altered. So what we have is a wonderful um, collection of historic buildings, both commercial, industrial, residential, uh, institutional, but they aren't necessarily functioning um, ideally for use in the 21st century. Energy wise, especially is one of the one of the challenges. But because we have this great housing stock, um, there's a lot of embodied energy there. And in order to have uh, you know a downtown that's fully built out like Rutland um, function and be vital and uh, continued, we want to activate all those spaces that we can. Um, one of and that's where adaptive reuse comes in. It's the way that historic preservation can serve, I think, um, community development, economic revitalization. It's a, you know, it it gives us a link to the past and a sense of um, place and and space through its architectural detail. Um, that I think is an important, and it's comforting to people. It's clearly comforting to people, but to, as I said before have these historic buildings not simply become um, empty pieces of sculpture that we appreciate because of the architecture. It's, you know, that to me is, is not what historic preservation is about. It's about um, keeping these buildings alive by continuing to use them. I, I, you've spoken, you've spoken a little bit about the, um, the kind of life of a space from that standpoint, what is the importance of um, a food system, right? And all the the parts of a food system and a network of farmers and producers and value added folks having a physical space in um, in in the food hub. Well, I think that having um, a place where a lot of uh, the raw materials and uh, people who are working on developing those or you know growing those raw materials a place where those people can come together and you know change exchange um exchange the goods or see them converted into finished products that it's very consistent with the history i mean in it wasn't food it was stone before stone and iron but um you know rutland and rutland's industrial architecture was a place where raw materials were turned into products. And I think that is what a food hub and a food center is about. And uh, it has more, uh, perhaps um, more engagement with the um, the farmers and the source, uh, but that's wonderful. It, it creates a community, um, not, not of, you know, factory workers necessarily, but a different kind of community. And that keeps those buildings very lively and very relevant to what's happening in Rutland today. Today in Rutland, a local food movement is reigniting the community, and the people that fill the historic architecture with purpose will adapt it to further use, ultimately keeping the spaces relevant. My grandfather, Peter, worked in the Lincoln Ironworks during its last great phase of output for the war effort. My great-grandfather, Pasquale, worked in the Lincoln Ironworks even before that in the 20s. During Pasquale's days at the Ironworks, the factory workers unionized and joined the American steelworkers to push back against the power dynamics of that day's economy. Farmer and Vermont Farmers Food Center founder, Greg Cox, has shown similar determination that those fellows would have respected by having the audacity to revive an aging factory through a driven community effort, ultimately pushing back against the centralized power of today's global food system. In 2012, when area farmers and food producers needed more space, Greg saw the potential of 251 West Street. So we, uh, we started um, looking around and the food center was a 2.91 acre industrial site. We had a list of what we would like it to be, large enough, lots of parking, easy to get, get to, as close to uh, the heart of downtown Rutland as possible, um, industrially zoned, 
loading docks, and this place had it all, had multiple buildings, um, <clears throat> and, um, and then we found some community members, the Gartners, whose, grand, whose grandfather was a farmer. And so they were like, we trust farmers. So we're gonna, we're gonna hold a note. And, and so we managed to buy the place, Winter Farmers Market, uh, doubled in size, um, 87 businesses set up, selling all their wares, most and a lot of food. Um, and then we started sharing, the farmers started sharing um, tricks of the trade. How do we grow food year round? And, um, and, and then being so visible, all of a sudden, it attracted more attention, more people. The dollars went from $350,000 gross for a year's worth of the farmer's market gross income, gross sales, um, to over $2 million in gross sales. That's a huge economic impact. And we would always look at, at the time, um, Local food, food being the food consumed in the state of Vermont, all the food, restaurants, institutions, you know, private citizens, was in excess of two billion dollars, and we were only like five percent being bought locally. If you were writing a business plan, that looks like potential. <laughs> so um, all of a sudden, we were like, "Wow! If we could turn that five percent." into 10%, we could start an economy. We can begin to, the, and that was why we picked that industrial site. It is because the industry has left Vermont, left most of America, and here we were gonna be able to now transition into the new economy, agricultural. So we repurposed an industrial building and made it into an agricultural site. We started pharmacy which FARM, and you know, I'm sure you've been discussing that. Um, when when uh, Irene, when, when COVID hit, um, everyone eats. We fed so many people and, and we're still feeding. The need is even greater than it was prior to COVID. And so let's, Let's um, let's have a center. So when this is pre Irene, but we were we we were already talking about what happens in a, a case of natural disaster because climate change, to some of us, was evident even back then, and it's like we need a place where we can aggregate food and distribute food, uh, so that people will have food um, in case of the the system starts to break down roads get washed out or whatever, transportation breaks down. So the site of 251 West Street has a history of worker unionizing. Um, and I wanted to know how you see this, this cultural history of, of our site at VFFC. Um, how do you see that connected to the work that VFFC is doing today in the food system? In a local food system, and, and this was the original vision of, of organic was it wasn't just a production practice. It's a food system with equity where everyone eats regardless of economic capacity. Isn't that what unions fought for? Equity, um, a better standard of living, a better environment, a safer environment, a cleaner environment. I think local food stands for all of those. Our folks that are economically challenged, and I deliver a lot of food to, to a lot of the organizations, and, and I'd walk in and I'd go, man, salt, sugar, fat, shelf stable in a can. This is not healthy for these kids, mom to bring home, but this is what we offer them, government subsidized, food that is helping to make them sick. They're economically challenged, they're not stupid. And they know when they're getting leftovers. People don't like leftovers. You wanna change their diet, you wanna change their capacity, give them the best. But guess what? 
free food is not free. Somebody's making money on feeding our, our challenged people this crap, and we're paying for it with our tax dollars in a local food system. That's, that would not continue because we'd be taking care of each other as if they were our family members. Farmer, author, and VFFC board member Philip Ackerman Leist has learned that providing opportunity in the middle of the food system is a critical component to overall food system resiliency, and that a large former factory might be an ideal location for a community food web hub. You know, I think we've seen you know small food entrepreneurs you know, really find their way by being able to utilize the commercial kitchen, you know, find their way into the marketplace, you know, the having the farmer's market at VFFC over the years obviously has, you know, created this galvanized community um, and, you know, just the ability to do, uh, you know, um, the ability to have a farmer's market that runs 52 weeks out of the year and the fact that Rutland, you know, has really led that cause in the state of Vermont is something that's really exciting. I think, you know, providing a place, you know, where anchor tenants can come in, those are more established food businesses that need that kind of infrastructure. It's not sexy, you know, but you need a loading dock. You need a place where you can actually, you know, where you've got floor drains. You need a place where you've got, you know, safe power, you know, when it's also mixed with water and steam. And, um, you know, so VFFC has really provided a need in that regard. So, you know, it's it's been exciting to see the development of all of those different parts over the years. I think one of the most critical elements of food systems really very often is, you know, what, what happens in the middle and what happens in the middle is about infrastructure. It's about space. It's about having warehouse capacity. It really is that aggregation, storage, refrigeration, distribution. Those pieces require, you know, a, a lot of space and also location is really important. So you need to have a location for a facility that, you know, is going to work kind of in our case, I think, thinking about the state, thinking about, you know, the ability to actually move food, not just through the state, but getting it into New York City, getting it into Boston. And so, you know, really in so many ways, the VFFC facility is ideally located, you know, for doing, you know, so much of this work in terms of the the middle of the food system. And, you know, the other piece that very often um, isn't there when you create a, um, a food hub, and I think we've got it because of where we are, you know, you also, you, you need access, you know, to building supplies, you need access to HVAC, you know, um, providers, there's all of this infrastructure that you're putting in place. And so you just, you really need to be, have access to the tradespeople and also to the supplies that are going to allow you to do all of the stuff that you've got to do in terms of the mechanicals of running a food system. So VFFC, you know, in some ways where it might seem like it's in an odd location, perhaps, you know, it's not exactly where you'd expect to see food grown. It is the kind of place and the kind of facility that you would expect to be able to to utilize and design just in terms of being able to do food processing. In many ways, 251 West Street is the ideal location. Unfortunately, sometimes our past catches up to us, and we are faced with confronting it. Before Vermont's farmers ever created organic food guidelines that pushed back against conventional chemical agriculture, that industrial chemical legacy was already entombed at 251 West Street, from a long history of manufacturing and subsequent neglect. In 2021, as VFFC was furthering the reuse efforts of the site, an environmental assessment of the property revealed trichloroethylene, or TCE, contamination. TCE is a known carcinogen and was likely left behind from industrial degreasers used in the mid-20th century. After the contamination was discovered, VFFC shut down the old ironworks building, now called Farmers Hall, on the 251 West Street site. This forced the winter farmers market to relocate in the middle of the season and caused disruptions to the pandemic-era prepared meals program. 
The plan to adapt this piece of the city's industrial past to create new local food opportunities seemed to be in jeopardy. The board and staff of Vermont Farmers Food Center had their work cut out for them. When we realized, when we went through the testing and found out that the air was potentially dangerous, I think we had no choice. There was no question. You do the right thing. How can you sell clean food and breathe dirty air? So I think um, I'm perfectly fine with that decision. What I'm not fine with is that the polluters never pay. This was, a, this was leftovers from that industrial age that no one is responsible for. And that is the negative externalities that once again, like with bad food, we all pay to address and cover those negative externalities. That site is going to be $800,000 of taxpayer dollars to clean that mess up. And the polluters will not pay. And, well, no, they don't have to. And so, but we're getting through it. It has been a most frustrating experience. This was a, quite a few body blows. And, but our staff, and we kept serving our, our, you know, the community, and we actually grew and did, you know, we always managed to do wonderful things, even though we had almost no space to do it in that little white building. But we pulled it off. The irony of the organic local food effort being temporarily derailed by latent chemical buildup from past production was not lost on board member Philip Ackerman Lest. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think there's an irony that's been evident to all of us on the board and kind of within the VFFC circle that you know, here, you know, the, the vision of VFFC and the sighting of VFFC that Greg Cox and others had, you know, was really to take one of the hardest hit parts of Rutland and, you know, find a way to, to really sort of infuse the notion, not just of healthy food, but healthy communities into this you know, part of Rutland that was highly industrialized um, and that you know, needed needed a, more than a facelift. It you know really needed to just be lifted up by its bootstraps, starting with food and then finding ways to really help people in the community understand you know what does it mean to rebuild a food system and you know you it doesn't have to be the white tablecloth high echelon approach it can be getting right in the middle of the nitty-gritty and you know confronting that and well you know the sighting posed issues obviously you know dealing with the contaminations you know that have had to be mitigated here over the past year um you know i think it probably has made i hope a lot of people aware that our, our food system um, is always facing these issues of Kind of contaminants and you know that we're always pushing for you know a healthier and safety food system and you know does it make sense to neglect certain parts of a community simply because of its industrial past no i think it's all the more reason really to you know embrace being situated you know right in the thick of that because it does speak you know really to where we've been but it also gives us the opportunity to provide a response to how we move forward together the folks at VFFC are addressing more challenges left over from an outdated, globalized economy than they initially set out to do, utilizing state money and grant money to do so. Lyle Jepson, Executive Director at the Chamber and Economic Development for the Rutland Region, is optimistic about the effect a food hub will bring to a countywide redevelopment effort. But what we're finding is what attracts people is... Um is the environment but also the natural surroundings which includes um, food hubs and how they can um, gather and purchase uh, natural naturally grown uh, locally grown food and that's becoming a real trend as we talk to people through our realrutland.com website um, we have a cones the earth program 
And we talk to a lot of people from around the nation and they want just that. They want locally grown food and they want to meet the farmers who are doing that. So what are some of the uh what are some of the major economic challenges that uh that Rutland faces, the Rutland area faces and maybe um if you if you have any specifics about maybe even the uh the kind of food farming, food business sector, um could you speak to to those? Sure. Um so the challenges we face are the same challenges that many areas in Vermont and around the nation face and that is a pretty significant housing shortage. Um, we have old stock housing here, and it needs to be much of it needs to be renovated, and or new housing stock needs to be um, built. It's very expensive to do that, so that is a challenge. Um, so when people call us from around the nation, they'll say, "Well, what's the housing market like?" Like, and we do talk about it. They also ask about childcare. They also ask about education, and they ask about food and what um what is grown locally and what um can they expect when they get here um we pretty much laud the uh, largest farmers market in the state of vermont being here in rutland um and one of the issues that i think that the vermont farmers food center is going to help us resolve is that there are value added opportunities for farmers and producers to create products but they need things like a commercial kitchen and so that is something that we're very excited in supporting and to that to that end um we supported a grant um that the farmers food center did get it was congressionally as uh, directed spending from at the time representative welch's office it's about a 1.6 million dollar um congressionally directed spending opportunity that will help with the revitalization of the farmers food center it's a, a big project a multi-million dollar project and so we're happy to have money flowing through through us directly to the farmers food center to support that reuse is extremely important to a downtown um, having a building or facility kind of lay waste and um, look worse every single year um, which is not the case at Vermont Farmers Food Center, but is not something that is of value to the city. It does not bring taxable income to the city. Um, so the city has less revenues, obviously, to then do the things they need to do. So reuse of uh, city resources um, is a, obviously a great idea. This time around, the site's closure didn't stop all momentum and lead to further decay. This time, there was a network built around the continual use of the space. Today's community food web was strong enough to overcome the weight of the site's history. On the next Root Words, we'll hear how Vermont Farmers Food Center's remediation and adaptive renovation efforts are set to support the community food web and create a more circular, localized economy where we all thrive together. This episode was produced by Stephen Abatel and Julia Anderson. Special thanks to Jack Crowler, Lisa Papazian, Philip Ackerman Lest, Greg Cox, Lyle Jepson, and all of the people who have brought life to 251 West Street over the years. If you would like to learn more about the history of the Lincoln Ironworks in Rutland, you can find a link to Jack Crowler's Rutland Historical Society report on Vermont Farmers Food Center's website under the About tab. You can also see VFFC's building renovation plans. Visit their website at www.vermontfarmersfoodcenter.org. Our musical themes are by the Salt Ash Serenaders. We are a project of the Vermont Farmers Food Center and SAGE. Thank you all for listening and for being a part of our local food system. We'll catch you next time on Root Words.